In case you're unfamiliar with them, a rail box car is a versatile, enclosed freight car that's commonly used on North American railroads. It carries diverse freight, including everything from beer and grain to appliances and pallets. The BX-166 boxcar is a 62-foot double-door insulated boxcar that has been a hallmark in the logistics of beer distribution all throughout North America, and particularly in its service to breweries in the western United States. The BX-166 is unique for its double-door configuration, distinguishing it from its fellow beer-hauling cousins. The defining characteristic on these cars, instantly separating them from the pack, are the diagonal braces on either side of the doors. No matter where you live or have rail fanned in North America, chances are you've seen this car mixed into general merchandise freights, both individually or in cuts of several beer cars. Custom built by the Santa Fe in 1974, a total of 300 BX-166 boxcars were built at the Santa Fe's car shops in Topeka, Kansas. Measuring 61 feet 6 inches in length, this icon of beer transportation has proven invaluable to the Santa Fe and later the Bensa. Originally built with interior load dividers, the boxcars prominently feature a Holland Load Snugger sticker above the plate C stencil. With a much storied history, the BX-166 was first unveiled in the Santa Fe's famous Indian Red Paint Scheme bearing a large white cross herald and shock control lettering. Later, the cars were repainted into a more minimalist scheme, plain mineral brown paint with a small Santa Fe herald affixed to the upper left corner of the car. Many cars in the fleet never received the small herald and feature only the reporting marks and necessary dimensional data. These two schemes alone account for much of what the BX-166 fleet looks like today. Given ongoing reshopping, paint schemes became many and varied over the years. To date, the BX-166 has been identified in 13 different paint schemes ranging from the original shock control cars all the way to Ben Seff's modern Power Bar logo. Roughly 40 years in service and still going strong today, many BX-166 boxcars have now been relegated to non-beer service, such as the hauling of bundled corrugated and paper recyclables. Some cars have also been retired altogether, but a large number of these cars are still living up to their original mission, serving major breweries with pride. The BX-166 remains a major beer hauler to date and can be found at western breweries and beer distribution centers all across North America. All you have to do is keep an eye out for that double door box car with its distinctive diagonal ribs on either side of the doors and you found yourself a BX-166 box car. The boxcar is probably the best recognized piece of railroad equipment ever put into service. Its history traces back to the earliest years when railroads realized that some freight commodities needed at least a little protection from the outside elements of mother nature. However, after the turn of the 20th century, the car truly became an industry icon and remained so up until about the 1960s. In 1870, the industry adopted general interchange agreements, meaning that boxcars could now go outside their home rails and onto other railroads. Since then, boxcars have gotten bigger and have transported goods all across the United States.
When the Canadian Pacific took over the DNH in 1990, both railroading and the world were completely different than it was when it sold the line 25 years later. Back then, CP DNH trains looked different because they were different. Paper and products that support the paper making industry made up the majority, or at least a good part, of the trains that rolled over the line during that time. Northbound, there was Kalen cars from the southeast, both hopper cars and tank cars, with a parade of names like Georgia Kalen, Engelhard, J.M. Huber, and even Sandersville. And this is when Sandersville still spelled out the name across their hopper cars. Southbound, there was an endless parade of box cars that carried paper of all types. But the most common box car, at least during that time, was the CP newsprint box car, just like the one you see here. Besides their green color, the newsprint box cars were distinguishable by the Canadian Pacific Shield with the words newsprint service only on the sides. This is a powerful throwback to the 20th century and the days before digital technology, specifically the internet, rendered most forms of printed media obsolete. For being such a small line, the Lake Erie, Franklin, and Clarion Railroad reporting marks LEF became somewhat well known in its later years as numerous freight equipment from boxcars to hoppers advertised the company's name and logo. Perhaps surprising given the Lake Erie, Franklin, and Clarion Railroad's small size is that it remained a mostly profitable company from the 1920s onward except for the Great Depression years through 1935. The Lake Erie, Franklin, and Clarion's roots go back to 1903 when the Pittsburgh, Somerville, and Clarion Railroad started building its line from a connection with the Pennsylvania Railroad at Somerville, Pennsylvania to the town of Clarion about 15 miles northwest. Clarion was originally served by a narrow gauge branch of the Buffalo, Rochester, and Pittsburgh, the B&O, but the BRMP's line was abandoned after residents refused to pay the railroad for repairs to a spindly trestle critical to the line paving the way for a new railroad to serve the town. The treasure initially sought in this area was timber, but in the early 1900s it became apparent that the area's coal was a commodity in demand. A second interchange on the south end was opened up at Sutton with the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern, later the New York Central. A branch was also built from Strattonville up Mills Creek and its rich timber, but this line was plagued by tight curves and was abandoned. In 1912, the railroad was reorganized as the Pittsburgh, Clarion, and Franklin Railroad, and in 1913, the line was merged with the Pennsylvania Northern and the Pennsylvania Southern, which owned portions of the line's property to form the Lake Erie, Franklin, and Clarion, a lofty title including two areas never served by the LEFNC. At its high point, the LEFNC operated about 32 miles of track, including branches. The LEFNC offered passenger service between Clarion and Somerville up until 1942 and also Franklin, Pennsylvania via trackage rights over the New York Central until 1924. In the 1930s and 40s, the LEFNC was home to several coal loaders and was operated with a fleet of 5 to 6 X Bessemer and Lake Erie steam locomotives. The LEFNC ordered its first diesels in 1949, a pair of Alco RS1s, and the line was completely dieselized in 1950. Coal traffic ebbed and flowed, but the LEFNC had many more years operating in the black than in the red. Coal tonnage was augmented by a few local industries, including a glass plant at Clarion, a brick plant at Somerville, an explosive distributor, and two lumber yards, and a mattress factory. Additionally, the LEFNC had a fleet of several hundred hoppers and later boxcars, and it earned sizable per diem revenue. Interchange partners changed over the years as the New York Central and Pennsylvania merged into the Penn Central and later Conrail. In the 1990s, the Pittsburgh and Shawmut's owner purchased the former New York Central line through Sutton and operated it as the Mount Laurel Railroad. In the 1990s, the LEFNC was down to just one coal loader, and once that operation shut down around 1993, so did the LEFNC. In its late era of operations, its traffic consisted of brick, sand, glass, coal, and lumber. Additionally, it picked up new motor power in the 1970s, which included two EMD SW1500s and later four newer MP15 DCs. It was the loss of coal mines in the 1980s and early 1990s that severely hurt the railroad and finally forced it to shut down. The Interstate Commerce Commission granted the abandonment on September 17, 1989.
1992, and the railroad's final day of operations occurred on January 5, 1993. Today, if one is lucky, you can still find LEFNC painted equipment in service, particularly east of the Mississippi River. Privately owned boxcars account for 22% of the market and their boxes have an average age of 19 years. It appears that railroad companies do not foresee a need to increase their ownership or increase their orders for new boxcars in the near future. In fact, many provide incentives and reduced rates to those who use private freight cars instead of using the railroad's fleet, which is why we see fewer and fewer railroad-owned cars by the year. Over time, railroads realized that more specialized cars were needed to haul unique types of freight which led to the development of well cars, auto racks, refrigerator cars, and several other specific designs. Box cars, however, still have their place in today's industry, especially in carrying bulky items such as auto parts. The government mandates that box cars be removed from service when they are 50 years old, which means that about 57% of the current box car fleet will be retired in the next 15 years. What's more, orders for new boxcars stand at only a fraction of all new freight car orders. But new technologies, such as newer boxcars with higher freight capacities, are slowly replacing the older cars. At the same time, some older infrastructure can't handle the bigger freight cars, especially here in the Northeast. Fewer industries today still rely on boxcars. Products that have traditionally shipped by boxcars are now being moved on newer, more efficient freight cars. Lumber is now shipped on center beam flat cars, which can haul more product per car than a boxcar can. Plus, they're easier to load and to unload. Auto manufacturers have moved manufacturing facilities closer to suppliers, making trucks a more economical transportation choice. The bigger downer is that railroads find boxcars less attractive than unit trains. In fact, you might remember in video T-179 when I said this. And notice that turnout up yonder. That runs behind a business called Fermano's. I don't know this for certain, but I think that they either ship or receive canned goods in those boxcars. Scenes like these are disappearing in railroading as Class 1s are abandoning carload freight in favor of end-to-end -end unit trains. The good news is that there are still holdouts for boxcars in America. And in addition to everything that I just said, always be on the lookout for historic fallen flag logos and liveries which still grace some cars, even decades after a particular company has disappeared. When a railroad gets power short, they get power from wherever they can. And this sometimes allows people with locomotives available to charge larger rates. It all depends on what the lesser can get from the railroad. Usually, the locomotives are older units, largely SD40-2s in those types, retired from Class 1 service. Brand new leased locomotives are not as common. Say, for example, your railroad needs 30 more units than it has to pull a glut of trains. New locomotives would take too long to arrive and may not be needed after the tonnage surge is over. So you talk to a lesser who lends you locomotives. The lease cost is significant, but less than the cost of not operating the trains, so you pay it, even though it's expensive. The lesser pays for the capital cost during storage with the revenue from the time the units were on the road, if all goes well, and they spend enough time on lease. When the leased locomotives aren't needed anymore, they go back to storage for the next time a railroad needs locomotives. I did an extensive deep dive into locomotive leasing operations in video T-155. Here's an excerpt from that video. Now railroads have better uses for their capital and are not likely to keep spare units around when not needed. So they sell the units or give them back to the lesser when the leases expire. When a locomotive comes off of a lease from a railroad, there will usually still be some economic life left in them. Because of this, some financial institutions still hold the title to the units and would like to get the remaining value out of their investment in them. Maybe they can sell it to another railroad or even another company. If there's a market for leased locomotives, one of the companies that specialize in them can either buy, lease, or administer a short-term lease of these units to others. 
It's the same approach as when a customer returns their leased car or truck back to the manufacturer. In the modern day, there's still a need for a locomotive pool to move around the country according to market conditions and leasing companies have taken up that opportunity. It also makes sense for them to use older locomotives for that purpose, but keep in mind that CEFX has brand new units that are leased on long term 100% of the year to the Canadian Pacific and the Union Pacific. The leasing arrangements today between the railroads and the leasing companies have evolved so that the leasing companies take the risk and the railroads pay a higher cost over doing it themselves. The benefit for the railroads is that they they end up with more capital readily available for other needs. I've provided a link to that video in the description box below and in the pinned comment. I highly recommend that you watch that video as it goes into great detail about locomotive leasing operations.